Lord Russell, what is philosophy? Well, that's a very controversial question. I think no two philosophers will give you the same answer. Um, my own view would be that uh, philosophy consists of uh, speculations about matters where exact knowledge is not yet possible. But that would only be my answer, not anybody else's. What's the difference between philosophy and science? <laughs> well, roughly you would say science is what we know and philosophy is what we don't know. That's a simple definition. And for that reason, uh, Christians are perpetually passing over from philosophy into science as knowledge advances. But when something is established and discovered, it ceases to be philosophy and becomes science. Yes. And uh, all sorts of questions that uh, used to be labelled philosophy uh, are no longer so labelled. What good is philosophy? I think uh, philosophy has two uses, really. Uh, one of them is to keep alive speculation about things that are not yet amenable to scientific knowledge. After all, scientific knowledge covers a very small part of uh, the things that interest mankind and ought to interest them. There are a great many things of immense interest about which science at uh, present at any rate has nothing to say. And I don't want people's imaginations to be limited and enclosed within what can be now known. And I think to enlarge your imaginative purview of the world into the hypothetical realm is one of the uses of philosophy. But uh, there's another use which I think is equally important, uh, which is to show that there are things we thought we knew and don't know. Uh, on the one hand, to keep us thinking about things that we may come to know, and on the other hand, to keep us modestly aware how much that seemed like knowledge isn't knowledge. Could you give some illustrations of the sort of subject which have been speculated about and then produce some material result later? Yes, uh, it's quite easy to do so, uh, especially from Greek philosophy. The Greeks invented a whole lot of hypotheses which turned out valuable later, but which in their day couldn't be tested. Take, for example, the atomic hypothesis. Uh, Democritus invented the atomic hypothesis that matter consists of little atoms. And uh, after about 2,000 years, rather more than that, it turned out that this was the, the right scientific view. But in his day, it was merely a suggestion. But didn't Plato think that Democritus' theory about atoms was a lot of nonsense? Plato was horrified by him, said all his books ought to be burnt because Plato didn't like science. He liked mathematics, but he didn't like anything else that was scientific. Now, in this way, philosophy, in a sense, becomes a kind of servant of science. Well, that's part of it. But, uh, of course, it isn't only a servant of science, because uh, there are a number of things that science can't deal with. All questions of values, for example, uh, science won't tell you what is good and what is bad. Uh, tell you what is good or bad uh, as an end, and not as, just as a means. But what change has there been over the years in the attitude of philosophers and the public to philosophy, would you say? Well, that depends upon the school of philosophy that you're thinking of. Uh, in uh, Plato and in Aristotle, both of them, there was, uh, the main thing was an attempt to understand the world. And that, I should say personally, is what philosophy ought to be doing. But uh, then you come on to the Stoics, and their emphasis was mainly on, on morality, that uh, you ought to be stoical, you ought to endure misfortunes patiently. And uh, that came to be the popular use of a philosopher. Would you say that Marx was a philosopher? <laughs> Well, uh, he, he was in a, certainly in a sense a philosopher. But now there you have an important division among philosophers. There are some philosophers who exist to uphold the status quo 
and others who exist to upset it. And Marx, of course, belongs to the second lot. But for my part, I should reject both those as being not the true business of a philosopher. And I should say the business of a philosopher is not to change the world, but to understand it, which is the exact opposite of what Marx said. What kind of a philosopher would you say you are? Well, uh, the only label I've ever of is logical atomist, but very keen on the label. I've rather avoided labels. What does mean, a logical atomist? Uh, it means, in my mind, that uh, the way to get at uh, the nature of any subject matter you're looking at is analysis, and that uh, you can analyze until you get to things that uh, can't be analyzed any further. And those would be logical atoms. I call them logical atoms because they're not little bits of matter. They're the, so to speak, ideas out of which a thing is built up. What is the main trend of philosophy today? Well, one would have to distinguish there between English-speaking countries and uh, continental European countries. The trends are much more separate than they used to be, very much more. In uh, English-speaking countries, and especially in England, there is a new philosophy which has arisen, I think, through the desire to find a separate field for philosophy. In uh, what I was saying a moment ago, it would appear that uh, philosophy is merely incomplete science, and uh, there are people who don't like that view. They want to have science, have a sphere, uh, philosophy have a sphere to itself. That has led them into what you may call linguistic philosophy. That the important thing for the philosopher is not to answer questions, but to get the meaning of the questions quite clear. I can't myself agree to that view, but uh, I could give an illustration. I was once uh, bicycling to Winchester, and I lost my way, and uh, I went to a village shop. And I said, uh, can you tell me the shortest way to Winchester? And the man I asked uh, called to a man in a back region whom I couldn't see. Gentleman wants to know the shortest way to Winchester. And the voice came back, Winchester? Aye. Way to Winchester? Aye. Shortest way? Aye. Don't know. And so I had to go on without getting an answer. Well, uh, that is what uh, Oxford philosophy is thinks one should do. We get the question right, never mind about the answer. Yes, it's somebody else's business to give the answer. How does this differ from the continental approach? The continental approach is, uh, well, it's more full-blooded. I, I don't agree with it anymore, but uh, in a sense it's much more full-blooded and much more like philosophies of earlier times. There are various uh, kinds. There's the philosophy that uh, comes from Kierkegaard existentialism. And then there's, there are philosophies uh, designed uh, to uh, uh, provide apologetics for traditional religion. There are various uh, things of that sort. I don't think myself that there's anything very important in all that. What practical use is your sort of philosophy to a man who wants to know how to conduct himself? A great many people write to me saying they're now completely puzzled as to how they ought to conduct themselves because they've ceased to accept the traditional signpost to right action and don't know what others to adopt. And uh, I think that the sort of philosophy I believe in is useful in this way, that it enables people to act with vigor when they're not absolutely certain that is the right action. I think nobody should be certain of anything. If you're certain, you're certainly wrong, because nothing deserves certainty. And uh, so one ought always to hold all one's beliefs with a certain element of doubt. And one ought to be able to act vigorously in spite of the doubt. After all, this is what uh, a general does when he's planning a battle. He doesn't quite know what the enemy will do. But if he's a good general, he guesses right. If he's a bad general, he guesses wrong. Uh, but uh, one has, in practical life, to act upon probabilities. And what I should look to philosophy to do is 
to encourage people to act with vigor without complete certainty. Yes, but now, how about this business, though, of um, making people so uncertain about things they'd sort of believe and had faith in? Uh, doesn't that rather disturb them? Well, uh, it does for a time, of course. Uh, and uh, I think a certain amount of disturbance is an essential part of, uh, of mental training. But uh, if they have any knowledge of science, they get a ballast which enables them to avoid being completely upset by the doubts that they ought to feel. What do you think is the future of philosophy? I don't think philosophy can, in the future, have anything like the importance that it had uh, either to the Greeks or in the Middle Ages. I think the rise of science inevitably diminishes the importance of philosophy. Well, would you summarize the value of philosophy? First, because, as I say, it, it keeps you realizing that there are very big and very important questions that science at any rate at present can't deal with and that an, uh, a scientific attitude by itself is not adequate. And uh, the second thing it does is to make people a little more modest intellectually and uh, aware that a great many things which have been thought certain turned out to be untrue, and that uh, there's no shortcut to uh, knowledge, and that the understanding of the world, which to my mind is the underlying purpose that every philosopher should have, that that is a very long and difficult business about which we ought not to be dogmatic. Thank you, Lord Russell. <laughs>